Hey, deserving listeners, love is blind. Let's watch and see what happens. What do you say about me? All good things. Good stuff? Yeah, I love you. You haven't said it. You said it, like, briefly. I love you. If you want me to yell, I love you. Okay, so she is often asking for reassurance, which on one hand could be evidence that she's just good at recognizing her needs and is asking for that. I think it would be totally normal for a lot of folks in these shoes to want some reassurance because although there is a lot of expression of love, you just can't trust it because you haven't had it for very long. So there's that. And you might wonder if they're just saying that because they don't want to hurt your feelings. So there's that. Or she has a need and an in insecurity that is exaggerated or from something in her past, in her childhood, and is um, struggling with that. Uh, I will point out that I, I think he's pretty hammered. <laughs> because I point that out because these shows, regardless of the reality TV show I'm watching, alcohol doesn't usually help with the functionality of people and their personalities. How are the boys? They're good. That woman does, is absolutely stacked. Hey, D. I say that in the most respectful. Babe, you can say whatever yeah. you... I don't know how that came up in conversation. I'm imagining they edited that out because he just kind of said that out of nowhere. It could be evidence of his intoxication, but I wonder if she said something that was like, hey, what do you think of the women's bodies or something? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. The way they're talking, she, earlier she was being pretty explicit about the size of his of his penis. And, you know, you know, nothing wrong with talking about that unless he's insecure about it, which he probably isn't. I don't know. I, was, I say he probably isn't because she was complimenting, I suppose. <laughs> anyway. And now they're looking over at AD and commenting on her body. I don't know. Uh, let's see how this goes. She's a book shelf. AD! Hey, how you get a butt like that? Squats and Jesus, girl. That's it. I saw what you said. He goes, that girl, Whoa. She's, she's pretty stacked. <laughs> AD seems to be responding well to it, but you can't know how someone really feels. It's a, it's a risk to just call out someone from across the room and comment on their body. It, uh, it can be overwhelming to people. You know. A lot of people say, well, she is wearing a dress that is accentuating things. She's, she doesn't seem insecure about it. You can't tell. Plus, someone might be absolutely okay with people looking at what they can see, but they don't want it to be focused on or called out or publicly discussed. It's like, sure, you know, like 80, I don't know, she could go home and say, or as she's getting ready, she could be like, yeah, I'm going to wear this dress because I like my butt and I want people to kind of look at it every now and then because I work hard for this or whatever. But she could also say, but I, I don't want it to be a topic of conversation, you know, and it all, you know, kind of depends on context as well. So I don't know. And I don't know if Clay is OK with this kind of talk. I don't know. It's just kind of a risk. But, you know, body positivity, uh, open communication, they're all pretty close, so maybe that's okay. Because I can't. Listen, I'd be in the gym. It was a compliment. It was a compliment. <laughs> it was subtle, gosh. AD. I, I, thought, I didn't take it offensive. <laughs> I said it in the most respectful way, so. I'm crying. Yes. No, yeah, squats and G's. Okay, so uh, they're continuing to talk about it, and uh, it sounds like for him, Jimmy, he's like worried that he might have been sexually objectifying her. So he's like, no, I meant it as a compliment. Uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> How else would you have meant it? Get it so he can <laughs> say it. <laughs> you pray for Babe, I'm sorry. That just happened. And then she tries to save him by saying, I said it, so he said it. That's not what happened. He said it, then she said it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Embarrassing me. I'm okay with that, hey, though. Hey, hey. Um, I'm, I'm just impressed talking to you. Thank you. You're just, you're the greatest. I am so embarrassed. She just called me the fuck out. He goes over to AD. Again, he's intoxicated. 
and I think is trying to say, I think what he's trying to do is, look, I like you as a person, <laughs> and that's, that's not the theme of what we're talking about here. And so he's doing that, which, I don't know, I, a lot depends on how AD feels about this. Is AD okay with this? Does AD actually want this? Does AD feel very objectified and harmed by this? <laughs> It's not a I mean, Charles, like, <laughs> can I do another tequila soda, please? Okay, then she says, it's okay, I'm used to it. Again, hard to know, because there are a lot of messages in our culture that are telling women that that is expected, it's normal, and what are you going to do? This is just how the world works, or this is your value, this is your worth, and... When you're being oppressed that way, you don't necessarily know what thoughts are yours and what thoughts are not. So I don't know. Uh, but it looks like everything is going okay and that 80 is fine. But now we're hearing the ominous music, and I think we're being led to believe that Chelsea feels jealous or ostracized or upset that he is talking to, to AD. I don't know why she doesn't just go over there and join in on the conversation because that might help. I don't know. Is is Jimmy a flirt? <laughs> he was not the person I would have thought that would be a flirt. But is he flirting? I don't know. Thank you so much. Want to come say hi, obviously. Not, not, not the way I wouldn't You're come say great. hi. You're fine. Chelsea has nothing but good things to say about you. Love her, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I love Clay. Are you, are you happy? With, with yeah, I, I think he's intoxicated and I love you, man. So I don't think he's hitting on her. And now I'm worried that Chelsea might have more preoccupation and more triggers and traumas around this sort of thing. She did say that she was cheated on. Yeah, she's she said, I've been cheated on a lot. And that alone can do a number on you, obviously. Like, it wouldn't be uncommon for someone in Chelsea's shoes to say, have been cheated on just by one partner, like her last partner or two partners ago. And just seeing her partner now, her current partner talking to another woman can just put a dagger through the brain. <laughs> Even though your prefrontal cortex is like, everything's fine. They're not having sex. They're just having a conversation. But it can be really disruptive and emotionally difficult to, to cope with. And you add alcohol to the mix and that takes your prefrontal cortex offline even more. And it's just all pain and worry and anger. So who knows what's happening here? Uh, so I, I just wonder if, if he actually is flirting. And I guess now I'm wondering if Chelsea is going to sabotage based on a situation that isn't worth sabotaging. Or is this situation worth sabotaging? I don't know. So I think um, just like getting used to it in person, like in the pods, it was like something that I could like sit there, chat. Yeah. But like now face to face, I'm like, shit, like it's a lot. I feel sick. All right. So there's that, there's that vomit sick feeling that she's talked about. I don't know what it's referring to. In the past, I wondered if it was just an expression, but, and maybe it was in the past, but this is pointing the direction that it's an actual physical sensation that she feels under intense emotions. Because she felt it when she was experiencing a lot of, or at least that's the way it looked, right? It looked like she was elated. And then she's like, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to throw up. But is it pointing to a danger feeling, a threat feeling, an abandonment feeling? that as she gets closer to people. So very briefly, disorganized or fearful attachment style, you know, you have secure, avoidant or dismissive, preoccupied or anxious, and you have fearful or disorganized. Sometimes it's called unresolved in the literature. For those folks, they were often abused, if not always, by their primary caregiver or caregivers. And the dilemma that they were in at the age of 18 months was that when children are afraid, they run to their parents, they run to their caregivers. A lot of social animals, a lot of animals that have offspring that stick with them will have that instinct. And humans are 
very much a, a good example of that. And the child under threat or discomfort or something will just will to just have an instinct to run to their primary care, caregiver. Well, what if the primary caregiver, oh, the other instinct that children have is that they run away from danger, even if it's not actual danger, right? They just see a stranger or they hear a loud noise or they see something scary on TV. They, they feel that danger and then they run to their, to their parents. Well, what if that threat is their parent? What do they do? Because they have a strong urge to run away from the danger, which is their parent, and they have an equally strong urge to run toward their parent because that's the person they instinctually want to go to for comfort. So what does the child do? They're stuck. And you rinse and repeat this enough times. And if it's of enough intensity, the child associates attachment with that feeling that they had when they were 18 months old. And it's pre-verbal, it's deep, it's all-encompassing. And so these individuals without repair will grow up and often have never experienced secure relationships and they are operating fine in the world. They have a job, they go to college, whatever, and they have friends and everything is, you know, typical. But when they want that security and they start to date or they start to get close to a friend or something, the closer that they get the more terrified they feel because that's what it was like when they were, the, the, the closer the relationship feels like it was when they were children, the more that feeling will emerge and they will have that duality where on one hand, the closer they get, they want to run to that person, but they also will be terrified of that person. And it'll be this weird mix of feelings, a weird mix of desperation and longing you know, because if they don't have that closeness enough, they can kind of get by. There's a lot of symptoms that can happen, anxiety and depression and other kinds of things, but it won't be an acute distress feeling. They get closer, and then that's when they start to have those feelings and they start to feel a lot of longing, a lot of desperation, a lot of obsessiveness. At the same time, they are terrified of that person and suspicious and worried and paranoid and they might even start distorting and inventing things in their mind as to what the other person is up to. At the very least, if there are any signs of any kind of abandonment or harm, then it becomes exaggerated, if not completely invented. I don't know if that's what's going on, but I, I'm just using that as a jumping off point. There can be various different degrees of disorganized attachment and some folks with preoccupied attachment style will have elements of disorganized and vice versa. You know, there's no distinct marker. It's not like every human has a label and it's easily delineated between all these groups. It's just tendencies and, you know, patterns and um, depends, you know, eye of the beholder. But, but it is notable that people with fearful disorganized attachment, they will talk about how, how scary it is. And they might word it differently, but it'll be clear that as they get close to people, it is terrifying for them. I mean, just utterly terrifying. The way an 18 year old would just, or an 18 month old would just be like, you know, 18 month old children are terrified anyway of the world and they are being abused and they want to run to their parents and what the children will be observed. And we've observed this in science, uh, Mary Ainsworth, John Bowlby, these folks. Well, actually it was this, this work was by Mary Main and Solomon. I believe I thought my head, in the 70s, 80s. And what they observed in the 18-month-old children is that these children in the lab, when they were with their parents, it's, it's a long, listen to my whole deep dive on attachment theory, but it's called a strange experiment, meaning that the child is exposed to a stranger. And long story short, because it's, it's a long procedure, but there's a moment where the parent leaves and comes back into the room. And we observe the child's response to the parent coming back. And for secure children, they will run to their parent because they, they missed their parent and they run to their parent and there's a little bit of emotion. And then they start to venture away from the parent towards the toys in the room. With avoidant kids, 
when the parent enters, the kid might not even notice or care, or at least there won't be any visible indication that they care. They'll, they'll be playing with toys. The parent walks back into the room. They'll be like, huh. Or they might be like, oh, well, anyway, because they're avoiding attachment and they're used to being neglected. The preoccupied kids will run to their parent and cling and might even be angry and have big emotion and cry a lot. Disorganized kids, and there's a lot of variability to what I'm saying here, but just to give you an idea of the kind of category of response we're talking about. For disorganized, fearful kids, they often will just freeze because the parent walks back in and they have an urge to run to the parent, but they also are terrified of the parent. The parent is the scariest thing in the room, scarier than the stranger that's in, because, you know, they have a, like a, a nurse, one of the researchers will enter the room as well. And the child is both desperately attracted to the parent and desperately wanting to run away from the parent. And so you'll see the kid kind of, sh- they'll have a they'll short circuit or they'll, they'll just fall on the ground or they'll just scream or run in circles. You know, it's like they don't know what to do. They have this equal urge and pressure psychologically. I mean, you know, that, that compulsion to run to your parents is, is like overwhelming. And we want that to be there. We evolved that clearly as a survival thing. You know, you can't have 12-month-old, 18-month-old children thinking, should I run to my parents? You know, there's a saber-toothed tiger coming. What do I do? No, you, you just it's just don't stop at go. Just you see a danger or anything that might be dangerous, run to your parents. And so they have that instinct. And they, they also have an instinct to run away from saber-toothed tigers. So, so there's like, and then when they're adults, they will have that feeling when they get close. So these individuals might also ask for a lot of reassurance because they are, with some reassurance, they're reassured kind of, but as soon as there's time going by, you know, they start, that that idea starts to creep back in that you're worthless, no one's going to love you. So I don't know, but it could just be that she is reacting to the infidelity that she had in the past, but uh, hmm. I'm going to take a guess and say that he, he'll, he'll make up for it and that he's just, he might not even be aware. Because the thing that we don't see is that they're supposed to be mingling. They're supposed to be like talking. It's also normal to just have conversations. And maybe he feels like he needs to establish like, look, I see you as a human being, AD. And so I'm going to have a normal conversation because I don't want that to be out there that I'm some sort of lech. So because uh, I don't think he's the type to flirt. And then he'll be able to make up to it to Chelsea and explain it and she'll be okay with it. But I don't know. This, this has hints of Danielle and Nick, right? Uh, it's starting to kind of smell like that. I don't know. I just feel very uneasy. Oh, I was. she talked about how she felt sick. So that could be a manifestation of that disorganized attachment, just, just that extreme stress that you feel under those kind of circumstances. It also could be evidence that a lot of how she processes emotion is just physically, somatically. It's, it's you know, some people have a twitchy eye when they get distressed. Some people have upset stomach. Some people might even vomit. It's also possible that this is more evidence of perhaps untreated eating disorder of some sort and that she will either encourage that to happen and make that happen because it will make her emotionally feel better. You know, when people go through trauma, they will uh, look for ways of coping with the uh, traumatic reactions that have to, that happen after the trauma. The PTSD, the complex PTSD, the anxiety, the distress, and it's physical. You know, it, after being traumatized, not everybody, but for many the the feeling that one can get it's not just psychological like oh i feel sad it, it's all encompassing it's like this extreme distress that people will feel particularly when when triggered you know there's dissociation that kind of thing and so people will naturally look for a way to feel better and in the absence of healthy ways which are not typically available to people like going to therapy talking about your feelings finding secure relationships uh, particularly young people because um, they have a harder time asking for help, and they don't have the power to find access. Of course, with the internet and more awareness, people have a lot more access these days. But 
anyway, you look for ways, and, and for some people, they might randomly come across self-harm, or they might randomly come across vomiting, or they might randomly come across drinking or marijuana or having sex with someone. And for a time, they feel less distressed. They don't necessarily feel better, but they, they're they distracted or it kind of numbs them out or something. And they either consciously or subconsciously say, ooh, let's continue doing that, especially when we feel upset. You know, like all of us do this. You have some way of dealing with your distress. Um, I have mine. When I feel bad, I go to my wife and talk about it. <laughs> There's probably other things I do as well. And why do I know to do that? I, I don't have a checklist. I just have a pattern, right? There's just a, an impulse to do that. And that it's not a natural impulse. It's, a, it's an impulse that's based on my experience. And so for some people who don't have other avenues, and sometimes the typical healthy avenues, they don't work well enough because talking about your feelings, even with a therapist, can only go so far. But if you completely numb out with a substance or some behavior like this, then it can really accelerate things rapidly. And so it can set in stone for some people this association with the stress and abandonment with that feeling because it's, it's almost like the body is trying to, one, symbolically expel the bad feeling, but also it's very distracting, right? You know, the, it, the routine of these kinds of uh, physical behaviors will become very, uh, it gives you something to do. It's a ceremony to it. You know, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you just get into this, this numb zone that you just follow. And for that time, you don't feel or notice the distress. It's not a happy time, but it's a less horrible time. And so I don't know. There's there's really no indication that she has an issue with that. All that we know is that when she feels distress, well, all we know is whenever she feels an intense emotion, <laughs> good or bad, she feels sick to her stomach. Who knows what exactly that indicates. I'm wearing gym shorts right now. <laughs> I already noticed. You got style, but like, I bet you none of these dudes know this at all. I peaked hey. like right off rip. I was like, oh yeah. Hey, I feel good, look good, feel good, play good. Well, <laughs> and then uh, AD was informed by Chelsea about his, uh, what he has to offer. And now she's kind of commenting on that. <laughs> but he doesn't know that she knows. I, I don't know what she's, com but it just sounds like she's commenting on that. So yeah, you know, they're drinking. They're just having a conversation. I hope, I'm hoping that Jimmy, and I have trust that Jimmy and Chelsea will be able to work this out. But I guess if this goes awry, her, Chelsea's issues and her defenses will kick in and she'll sabotage by being overly hostile or accusatory or distancing or something. And or he will not respond well to the criticism and will get defensive like what he was doing with Jessica, he becomes real like quiet and shut down and just defending himself. So I, I could see that happening. I want to puke. I'm going to go. Um, Would you see my glass here? But I'm okay. I'm not, like you look good. I'm, I'm not trying to impress you, you know? I mm -hmm. do a little bit. Well, I think he's just kind of nerdy, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> and, uh, I think he's just, uh, and intoxicated. So I don't know if he's flirting so much as just putting his foot in his mouth a lot. She's looking good. And I called it out. I was like, yeah, AD, like, you are looking good. Like, how are you getting butt like that? Like, called it out. Yeah. Like, kind of making an uncomfortable situation. Okay. That's interesting. So she is saying that it wasn't, it didn't feel good when he was saying those things. Because it didn't look like it. She seemed to be agreeing. Like, yeah, let's, let's talk to her about it. And then she initiate, and it could be a passive aggression that she announced to the whole party that he said that, right? It could be a way of trying to get back at him slightly, passively. So she's saying it was uncomfortable for her. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 More comfortable, and then I, I like see Jimmy like turning AD around, like with her hand, and like like looking at her body. I don't know. And then after like that comment, I don't know. I f I feel odd. 
Yeah, and then he said the first thing he noticed about her, Chelsea, were her boobs. So with limited information about him, Jimmy, and his love for her, Chelsea, you know, you start wondering, right? They don't have a lot of trust because there's not a lot to go on. It's one thing saying, oh yeah, like the guys are great, they all look great, but like, I don't know, when you're saying like a comment about somebody else in front of the person that you love, Okay, so Amy is being triangulated, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing. And Amy is being validating and reiterating or commenting on exactly what it is that's bothersome. If I were in Amy's shoes, I would just focus on how Chelsea feels and what she might want to do. So how do you feel about that? What do you want to do about that? What are you thinking? Because... Anything that I say, any sort of conclusion can just add to things. Plus, for uh, of, often the case for people in Chelsea's shoes, you don't necessarily need someone to summarize. Uh, and I'm not saying Amy did something bad, but I'm just saying that this is just a general guideline to follow that I find is not very prevalent or talked about much, that when people are in a situation like that, we have an impulse to fix Amy's not trying to fix, so that's good. Or we have an impulse to overly validate, which can be good, but I don't know about you, but for me, when I'm going through something, I just want someone to listen and to be interested and show interest and to ask questions along the lines of that they're interested. You know, not like asking for details or asking things that are unrelated, you know, asking things to the core. Because she hasn't talked, Chelsea hasn't said how she feels, but she's, she's pointing out, she's like, ah, that's, that's, I don't like, but maybe it would help if Chelsea had someone help her with, so are you feeling insecure? Are you feeling hurt? Are you feeling rejected? Because that might help Chelsea to, one, just start to solidify her reactivity, her emotions, which gives her a chance to kind of know how to manage it, right? And also can, you know, can be a lot more validating. So I'm not saying Amy's doing a bad job. I'm just saying for us all. And he was so sweet. Just like just a second ago, he's like, "What are you guys talking about? Like, oh, like I love you so much. Like this is like so great." But I don't know, man. Yeah. Like yeah. I know he's into you. Like it's mm -hmm. it's evident. Like the way like he talks to you and, and looks. Okay. So yeah, I think Amy's being great, and I think that Chelsea is mulling it over. Right. This is indicating that she has some differentiation. She's like, well, wait, I mean, earlier, because if she were particularly trauma reactive and particularly traumatized, there would be no pulling out of it. And we've seen this before. Danielle and Nick, actually, at the party uh, scene, seemingly, actually, they were going through something like that, where literally, because she didn't feel well, then Nick went down to the party and she was watching. He didn't know she was watching, but she saw Nick talking to other women Nick, from my memory anyway, wasn't flirting. He was talking to women and he was drinking. And then that really threw her like down a deep well of pain and anxiety and depression and distress. At least that's the way it looked. And she couldn't pull out of it. She couldn't reassure herself that the things that Chelsea is reassuring, she's like, well, wait, so there was that thing. You know, she's, she's trying to be objective and not run away with one aspect of it. Now, you know, maybe Jimmy is a jerk face and a lech and a flirt and a and he'll cheat or something, but you know, just this alone can't you can't conclude that. Yeah. But I don't want to be in a relationship where I have to question. Yeah, you know, no, like, that's the thing. You're you going into a marriage. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah. You don't question it. Like I don't Hmm. Yeah, I think what she's referring to is she's had questions from the very beginning because of a number of aggravating factors. You know, Jessica, the way that Jimmy was when they first met in the hallway, the way he talked about her teeth, <laughs> the way he talked about how he, he wanted to go home the morning of meeting in the hallway. You know, there's enough detail to give someone questions. But... Uh, at least my gauge is that Jimmy, there's a pot. 
there's no way to know, but I think there's a strong possibility at this moment that Jimmy is 100% in. And I haven't shown all the scenes, but there's been a lot of reassuring talk from him, the sort of things that you would hear from someone that eventually says yes at the altar. So I'm. it's kind of looking like she is, you know, that, that Chelsea is overreacting and interpreting. But I don't know. And the problem is, is that if she convinces herself enough of this, she could push him away and it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't like that feeling. It's not, and it's not even like being insecure or like having a... And the way that she's talking, it makes me worry because she's not saying things that like AD would say, where she's like, well, I've been to therapy and I know this about myself. She just declared, Chelsea, I don't want to be in a relationship where I have to question things. And another question would be, what is it about me that makes me question things so much, right? Because there's there's certainly not like a slam dunk indication that when Jimmy says he loves her and wants to be with her and is very attracted to her and considers her to be beautiful, there's there's nothing that would rival that in terms of a data point. So there's that. Plus, you know, they edit it and there's always the music and da da da. So we could even be seeing it in a more in a more concerning way. They also could be cutting stuff out. We're not hearing anything along as I. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried because I'm not hearing her, her say anything like, but I have a problem with reading into things and overreacting. Maybe I'm not doing that right now. I just don't know. I, I would just hope that she would say something like that. Come to make again. Yeah. Like what? It's making me feel uncomfortable. I know he cares about me. I know that he feels a certain type of way about me, but Look at, look, look. <laughs> look at what? He's just talking to... It. Now, the precursor is him seemingly unsolicitingly talking about her body to, to Chelsea. But it could have been prompted by something. They didn't show us the entire conversation, obviously. So it, it could have been prompted by Chelsea herself. Didn't look that way in the edit. But he's just talking, you know, a lot, of, every, a lot of people are talking to people. <laughs> what do you think's happening? Do you think that he wants to have sex with AD? Is, is that where this goes, you know? He could just be having a conversation. And I, I'll also point out that Jimmy isn't uh, super aware of the landscape. You would think he would keep an eye on Chelsea, <laughs> especially with this new scenario. Like, you think a little editor in his mind would say, okay, I'm talking to a woman and I just told Chelsea how I thought she was attractive and I've never been in this situation before. So maybe I need, you know, because if they had been married, Chelsea and Jimmy for 25 years, and he just knew that Chelsea was cool with this kind of stuff, then that'd be one thing, but he doesn't know. And so you just think he would kind of, now maybe for him, he's just like, why would I worry? I wasn't flirting. I was just having a conversation. It didn't even occur to me that Chelsea would think, what? No. You know, he might be kind of naive in that way or so. I don't know. Would be an incredible couple. Like, my opinion of Clay is right fucking here. I, like, look at him. He's so damn good looking. I took in the wrong direction. I love talking to you. I love talking to you. You're not judging me for coming in almost. And then Chelsea has the the click from the lounge descending which might not help so now amy was i think pointing out some things that were helpful like he you know he loves you so yeah i'm not encouraged by now let's say that jimmy is doing something wrong or uncool he's being too familiar with ad in general and that he is exhibiting some kind of attraction or crush or something. Let's just say that. Well, even still, if we believe that Jimmy isn't on the road to cheating or leaving Chelsea because of this behavior, then Chelsea would do well to be hurt and recognize that and then talk to him about it and say, hey, you know, I, just, I don't know what was happening, but earlier hurt my feelings. So we'll see how she does with this because if she sabotages and, and and creates a problem that is not easy for someone like Jimmy to 
recover from. Also, if they choose to talk about what, while they're drinking, that, that could be a disaster. <sighs> this is a bummer. If this goes the way it's kind of looking like it will, it could be like a really silly event that could ruin a relationship with a lot of potential. <laughs> Uh, we got a whole seat. Come on, Shug. Give how's, me the deeds. How's it going? I'm good. You're good. Phenomenal. <laughs> you know, you were my first date. Yes, you were my first date. You don't even remember that. You I just... do. So then this happens, and he's just walking into it. <laughs> I think he's just kind of a doof, honestly. Uh, and... You'd think he would look over at Chelsea and just see her face, but I don't think he can see. Laura's kind of blocking the view. It's just, it's uh, it's hard to watch. Like, Chelsea, just, just grab Jimmy, pull him aside, say, we got to talk, you know, just don't. It's so, ugh. How, how hard was it for y'all to narrow 15? It wasn't hard for me. Honestly, it was not hard for me. Really? I'm very picky. Yeah. Yeah, it was Well, that sucks because I didn't make either one of y'all's list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think he's just a he's just a doof. And he says he doesn't uh, you know, the things that he says, you have big white square teeth. He, and he says it I think from a good place. <laughs> I think he just doesn't really understand <laughs> uh, but I guess there's a possibility that he doesn't care so that's the question does he know that he's pressing the envelope or does he not even know the envelope exists oh, shit. Oh, sorry <laughs> clearly yeah <laughs> anybody need anything I'm good good all right it's good thanks for letting me hang out yeah of course Yeah, not promising. Uh, I'm worried that everyone will hate me because I'm not, like, blasting him. I don't know, but I can only react to my bias, I suppose, or something. So, like, the question is, is he legit flirting? Is he legit not caring about her feelings? I imagine he eventually saw that she was uncomfortable and... He either is saying, well, maybe it's something else, or he's like, I don't, I didn't do anything wrong, or I don't know. It, it has, given everything we've seen, I would imagine if he really registered that she was upset, that he he would pull her aside. Also, I, just that, that clicky kind of look, it just feels like middle school, like, oh, here he comes, oh, oh hi. And then as soon as he's like, oh, he's a dick, and we hate him, right? They edited it. I don't know if that's what was happening. But it kind of had that thing. And to see Chelsea, like, plummeting and pushing him away. So, you know, he's going to start talking with everybody and maybe other women. You're at a party. You're five couples. So that will cause her to spiral downward even further. I don't know. It's um, People don't do this because they want to. They do it because of trauma. And... I like AD, she's in therapy, she's worked on it, she's aware of it, differentiation, and just kind of looks like Chelsea just has has no lifeline to hold on to when she plummets, but I don't know, we'll see. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone, please take care of yourself, truly, because you deserve it. You do.